Before we read it, I want to reference an article that came out by the New York Times just a few days ago titled, The Anti-Resolution Revolution, Five Vows You Can Keep. The author named Haley says this, starting with the ancient Babylonians some 4,000 years ago, humans have marked the new year with a masochistic custom, <laughs> making resolutions they know they will not keep. Recently, however, a good many of us have decided to say the heck with it, resolving to accomplish or not accomplish feats that run delightfully counter to conventional self-improvement wisdom. I thought I'd just read the first couple of them that she recommends. Number one, don't go to the gym. Sleep. A good night's rest reduces stress, curbs appetite, and even burns calories. Show up these athleisure-wearing hashtag Fitzpo influencers by investing in a wardrobe especially made for your slumbrous new sport. Sleepy Jones striped sleep top, $98 and leggings, $98 at sleepyjones.com. Or the DKNY midnight blue washed satin pajama set. They complete with advertisements in the article. Number two, stay in your style rut. Variety is overrated. All that experimenting with colors and new styles is exhausting. Instead of reprimanding yourself for not being more adventurous, give in to your style rut. Start thinking of it as a groove. <laughs> I mean, I've been doing that my whole life. These people need to get in on, the, get on what the rest of us are doing. Well, apparently the anti-resolution revolution is growing with books and articles proliferating to encourage people to not make or to make easy resolutions to keep. I'd like to go against the grain of anti-resolution fervor and offer a resolution that can, and I believe by the grace of God, will be fulfilled by our church and in our own lives this year. I'd like to offer the resolution of thankfulness. We have a tradition as a church, if you're a guest, of using the last Sunday of every year to highlight this biblical giant of a theme, thankfulness. Obviously, we talk about it throughout the year, hopefully, but we, we set aside this entire message to focus on it specifically because it's appropriate as the year ends, as anything ends, to celebrate the grace of God that is present first and foremost in our salvation, but also prevalent in our everyday lives. So thankfulness is the theme of our morning's message, and it is a resolution I'd like to commend to you. Of all the resolutions you've been pondering, keeping, or rejecting starting tomorrow, I would like to encourage you to consider thankfulness as probably the most life-transforming resolution you could make of any others this next year. Thankfulness. Thankfulness. I'd like to read Paul's command of thankfulness in 1 Thessalonians 5 beginning in verse 16. Paul says this, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. Paul is reaching the end of his letter to the Thessalonian church, a Thessalonian church that he had a lot of affection for. We were studying in Acts. We're going to resume that at the beginning of the year. We'll hear about the planting of this church. It was planted in a situation of extreme difficulty and persecution, and yet Paul had this incredible affection for this church and for the grace of God that was present in them. If if you read the Thessalonian letters, uh, they're they're some of the most affectionate, uh, abounding with gratefulness terminology of all Paul's letters. Philippians would be right there with them. But Paul's just very affectionate and grateful for this group of believers Uh, this church that he 
planted. And in the end of his letter, he's, he's commanding them that in light of who they are in Christ, there are certain characteristics that are to be pervasive in their lifestyle. He lists three here. Rejoice always. So a kind of worshipful joy is always to be present in the Christian life. They are to pray without ceasing. And then the final one that we're going to zero in on in verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Paul commands them to have a comprehensive lifestyle of thanksgiving. And he has this, he basically does this in two parts. He has the command, or this three-part command. We're going to focus on the last part of giving thanks. And then he has the cause for this command, or the motive. He says, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So that's how we'll break up the message this morning. The command and then the cause. The command and the cause, or the motive. Give thanks in all circumstances. And this is a life trait, a characteristic that is commended throughout the centuries by Christian teachers who have studied the scriptures and, and studied Paul in particular. Charles Spurgeon says this, he, would, who, he who would serve God must begin by praising God, for a grateful heart is the mainspring of obedience. We must offer, I love this phrase, the salt of gratitude with the sacrifice of obedience. Our lives should be anointed with the precious oil of thankfulness. As soldiers march to music, so while we walk in the paths of righteousness, we should keep step to the notes of thanksgiving. Larks sing as they mount, so should we magnify the Lord for his mercies while we are ringing our way to heaven. G.K. Chesterton says this, when it comes to life, the critical thing is whether you take things for granted or take them with gratitude. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, it is only with gratitude that life becomes rich. And William Law, the famous Puritan, says, if anyone would tell you the shortest and surest way to all happiness and all perfection, he must tell you to make a rule to yourself to thank and praise God for everything that happens to you. Those were men who had studied and considered the overwhelming emphasis of thanksgiving in the scriptures and in Paul in particular. And Paul is commanding the Thessalonian church, give thanks in all circumstances. Let's first look at this command that he gives before we get to the, the motive that he provides. First, the, the command has this definition of giving thanks. It's a single word in the Greek, and it basically has this idea of, of an action that we do. So thankfulness is not merely a sort of a, an optimistic disposition. It's not cheerfulness. It is an action taken towards God. This is an active command. We are to give thanks. We are to be thankful towards God. It's an active activity that we offer to the Lord as a result of what he has done. And I'd like to offer this definition. If you look at Paul and what he gives thanks for, I think we could say that giving thanks is praising God for his gracious and merciful activity. Giving thanks is praising God for his gracious and merciful activity. It, it, is, it is not merely the receipt of a, a personal and singular benefit, because Paul gives thanks for the grace of God in other people. He, he apparently considers the giving of thanks to be appropriate any time he encounters God's gracious activity. He considers that sight whether it be seeing it in someone else or seeing it in his own life or in studying the scriptures or in seeing it in the world in common grace, anytime he sees God's gracious and merciful activity, giving praise to God is what Paul would call giving thanks. So praise God for his gracious and merciful activity. That's the definition of what Paul is calling them to do. And this is very, very important because the lack of thankfulness is seen in Scripture as not merely an, an optional, uh, un, you know, unintentional miss by a Christian. It's seen as a catastrophic failure of our fundamental responsibilities. We, we tend to view thankfulness as kind of like the optional extra for mature Christians. The Bible views thankfulness as a fundamental calling of a human being. 
This is what Romans says when it's talking about the pagan world. Unthankfulness is one of the key marks, the founding, grounding marks of what leads the pagan world away from God. The failure to give thanks to him. Romans 1.21 says, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or, listen, give thanks to him. When God looks at the world, unthankfulness ranks right up there with all kinds of atrocious social sins. And as a way of honoring R.C. Sproul, the theologian who went to be with the Lord just a few weeks ago, let me read this quote about what he says about thanksgiving. The resistance to authentic thanksgiving is inherent to fallen humanity. It is not inherent to humanity as such because when we were created originally in the image and the likeness of God in the pre-fall Garden of Eden, every day was Thanksgiving Day. Every day was a day of feasting upon the fruit that God had made available for his creatures. And every moment God came into the garden, he was greeted by loving, adoring creatures whose hearts were filled with gratitude to even be in the presence of God. But with the fall, something serious happened. Something penetrated the very soul of our humanity that still persists to this day, and that is a deep-rooted reluctance toward gratitude before God. Or as Jerry Bridges, who is also with the Lord now, says, giving thanks to God for both his temporal and spiritual blessings in our lives is not just a nice thing to do. It is the moral will of God. Failure to give him the thanks due to him is sin. It may seem like a benign sin to us because it doesn't harm anyone else, but it is an affront and insult to the one who created us and sustains us every moment of our lives. The Bible, Paul, God takes thankfulness very seriously, counts it as a fundamental calling of a human being and certainly a fundamental privilege of a Christian to give thanks to God. God. Now, I want to make it very explicit that the direction of this thanks is God. That's Paul's understanding. Paul, when he says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and then he he adds this cause, this is the will of God. He's making it clear that we're, we're giving thanks to the Lord. We're reflecting back to him the grace he has given to us or that we see present uh, in the world or in other human beings. The direction of this grace is Godward. It's something we give to God. I, I saw an article uh, this week titled, Gratefulness, the Secret to Happiness. And I, I don't disagree with that. I actually think gratefulness does produce a lot of joy and happiness. But I suspect that the author has misunderstood gratefulness and optimism. That the facade of a kind of a, a vague gratefulness, just be grateful for your day, be grateful you're not sick, be grateful you have a family. That, that what they mean by that in, in the world or in articles like that is just something like optimism or, or, uh, or sort of an appreciation for good things in life. But that is not what the Bible means by thankfulness. The Bible means rendering back to God the credit for the grace we perceive in our own lives or the lives of others. It has a a God direction. It's not just a a happy-go-lucky, whistling while you work, seeing the good things in life kind of common appreciation. No, it is Godward. It is saying God has done great things, and we have a responsibility to reflect that back to him in praise, called thankfulness. Biblical thankfulness requires a realignment of our whole soul, a new perspective on the author and giver of every good gift, a willing acknowledgement of God as the giver of every good thing on this earth. This is what Paul is commanding his fellow Christians to do. We also want to notice the duration of this command. Give thanks when and how in all circumstances. So the command is a command, first of all. It's also given to God. It's comprehensive in scope in all circumstances. God is not commanding us to lie. And so it must be the case that in every circumstance we are in, there is some presence of his gracious activity. Let me say it again. Let me just clarify the logic here. Clearly, God is not commanding the Thessalonian church or us to lie to be flatterers of him. So what it must mean 
is that since we are to give thanks in every circumstance, and since thankfulness is just the recognition and praise of God's gracious activity, it must mean that in every circumstance there is evidence that we can see if we would see it of God's gracious activity at work. God is not cultivating a church body of flatterers, of God flatterers. No, he's asking us to actively see accurately his gracious activity at work in our lives and in the world. Thankfulness is not merely optimism. Now, I was thinking this week about this, and I thought about my my wife who's constantly having to remind me to clean my glasses because I've had glasses for 15 years or something now, and I still have not been willing to admit that I need them. And so I don't clean them because I don't want to admit I have them. And it's a really stupid way to do life, but that's what I do. I wander around with large scratches and smudges and so forth on my glasses. I don't notice if somebody else says, what have you done to your glasses? I have glasses. I mean, that's usually my reaction, something along those lines. And, 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 but I, I thought about, you know, that's, that's a little bit uh, like this situation. It, it is not as though God is telling the Thessalonian church to walk around with rose-colored glasses. You've heard that expression to act as though things are better than they are. That is not what thankfulness is. It is not mere optimism. Thankfulness is cleaning your glasses to see what is actually there. So in calling us to thankfulness, Paul is not recommending a kind of denial of life. He's pointing out that a failure to be thankful is a failure to see. It's a failure to see what is actually present in the world. God's actual gracious activity in our lives and the lives of others. It is not mere optimism or denial or facade. It is the ability to actually perceive God's activity and to render back to him the credit for that activity that is undeserved and yet present in our lives and in the lives of this world. We are called in all circumstances to give God the credit for the grace that is present in those circumstances, for the mercy that is present in those circumstances. So this is, this is not a, a burden to see what is not there. It is the calling, the privilege to see what is there and to give God the credit for it. It turns this troubling command at times into a privilege, a treasure hunt. God is not asking us to do the impossible. He is inviting us to see His grace at work in the most difficult and trying of moments. Because it is at work. This passage speaks of a God who is at work in all circumstances and therefore worthy of gratefulness for that work being gracious and merciful towards us. Let's think of a few circumstances where we, we need to reflect gratefulness back to God for His grace. A number of them. We just run through them quickly. When we encounter the image of God in non-Christians. Non-Christians are made in the image of God. That image is broken and cracked, and yet still vestiges of it remain. And so there is order in the world Many times because of the work of non-Christians who are still honoring God in that order even as their hearts are far from Him. There is beauty and creativity in the world made by non-Christians that are only able to do that because they're made in the image of God even though their hearts are far from Him. There are services offered in the world made by non-Christians even though their hearts are far from Him. And every time a Christian encounters the image of God and it receives benefit from it, there should be exploding from our heart a gratefulness because God did not obliterate humanity and allow them to continue to exist and even to continue to reflect, even in some broken way, His perfect and glorious glory. So when we encounter his image, even in some limited way in non-Christians, it is an opportunity for us to celebrate the grace of God and his mercy of extending the life of humanity and allowing us the privilege of continuing to reflect him. If you want a book on that topic, I would highly recommend Practicing Affirmation. If you want to be challenged in your own definition of what thankfulness and gratefulness to one another is, read that book and let Sam Crabtree take you to school as he did me. 
When we encounter the image of God in non-Christians. Another category, when we encounter a fellow Christian. Here's a circumstance, a circumstance that should be easy to bring gratefulness to our hearts. This is just some of the, the circumstances we find ourselves in. When we are encountering a fellow Christian, we must never, ever take it for granted that God has rescued a person from death to life, has forgiven their sins, has given them himself as an eternal inheritance. The sight or thought of a person who is in Christ, no matter how much they still struggle with sin or how burdensome they are to us, should overwhelm our heart with gratitude to God. This should be more significant to us than their current sins, than their ongoing struggles, than the ways they have disappointed us, than their failures, than how far they have to go. It should be that their identity in Christ is only and exclusively an act of God's grace towards them, the same grace that we have received. So when we look at a fellow Christian, we are see ourselves in a mirror, and that reflection should well up in our hearts a gratefulness to God. When we walk in this room, we should see reflections of ourselves and our salvation everywhere. When we're dealing with a fellow Christian, no matter how much they are struggling, how difficult they are, how tempting they are, how burdensome they are, we we are seeing in a mirror our own salvation displayed in their confession of Jesus as their Savior. And their imperfections should not distract us from giving gratefulness to God for His grace in their life. What about a third circumstance when we experience the painful gift of suffering? I suspect Paul had this particularly in mind with this church who was born in a season of suffering and persecution. No human being other than Jesus Christ could say this with greater integrity than Paul to give thanks in all circumstances. Suffering reveals the sustaining grace of God. Suffering is used of God to keep us close to him. Suffering is always temporary and brief compared to our eternal reward. Suffering is always small in comparison to the salvation we've been given in Jesus. There is always cause for thankfulness for God's gracious activity in the midst of suffering. About a fourth circumstance, when we experience the pleasant test of prosperity. Sometimes all of us can be afraid to be grateful in physical or relational prosperity. As if to be thankful that our car didn't break down or we got a promotion or we're enjoying some possession or relationship or we remember we're in good health or we're able to go on vacation is somehow less spiritual or maybe even would tempt God to remove that from us as though he wants us to enjoy it but not not talk about it too much. If you've ever heard the expression knock on wood, I think that's present even in Christian circles. It's sort of a, a way of saying, well, I, I, I want to acknowledge I want to acknowledge that at any moment this could go away. I don't want to talk about it too much because if I talk about it too much, God, God might want to come down and, and remove it from me. But I think that's based at times on a, a wrong view of the character of God. Yes, he does take things from us. Yes, he does bring suffering into our lives and discipline and so forth. Yet, Yes, he does. He does. He allows those things and even brings those things. Yes, but, but that, that's not because he doesn't want us to enjoy his generosity too much. In God's mind, it is all a flow of generosity. God's not a, a grudging father ready to snatch a toy away the moment we enjoy it too much. He might give us the gift of suffering. He might also give us the test of prosperity. But it's so that we can reflect gratefulness to him, not so we can guard ourselves from some view of his grudging nature. No, it's a wrong view of God. All circumstances includes prosperous circumstances where we gladly give thanks to God for those moments of prosperity and blessing that we enjoy. While all the while knowing that they are meant to lead us to him and not to delight in them apart from him. Every good and perfect gift comes from him. Fifth circumstance, when we're looking at our family, when we look at our family, gratefulness should rebound from our hearts. Husbands, gratefulness to God should be our habit when we think about our wives. 
Parents, gratefulness to God should be our habit when we reflect on our children. Marriage and parenting are two circumstances in which we are called to give thanks. Painful will be the marriage, and poor will be the parenting that is characterized by complaining rather than oiled with thankfulness. Children, children, if you're a child at home, when you look at your parents, if they are feeding you and clothing you and are doing their best to love you and direct you towards God, you have much to be thankful for. No parent is perfect. Every parent that I know in this church is seeking to honor God and provide for and care for their child. So every child has much to be grateful for. Sixth circumstance, when someone lets us down. When someone lets us down. Disillusionment can lead to a shipwreck of faith. It's easy to decide never to trust or love anyone again. But thankfulness for the gracious activity of God, even in a person who has let you down, is a bastion against bitterness and self-righteousness. I have seen churches ruined because people refused to focus on gratefulness in a season of disillusionment. If we are only aware or even primarily aware of a person's sins or failures or weaknesses, we have lost sight of God's command to be thankful in all circumstances. We may even be disobeying him to marinate in the thankless evaluation of others. Gossip, slander, division, hatred, animosity all grow quickly in the soil of a thankless heart. Thankfulness. It's like that stuff you buy at Home Depot. You put it in the ground and weeds don't grow. Thanklessness is like doing nothing and expecting the weeds will just stay away on their own accord. Seventh circumstance, when our spirit feels dry. How many times have you been sitting across from a Christian and either saying or hearing, I I feel dry right now. I feel spiritually dry. Let me, let me try to draw a connection between thankfulness as a habit and dryness of spirit. A thankful heart is watering the soil for the fruit of joy to grow. If you've noticed that your heart is dry when you read the word, when you pray, when you worship, if you've noticed that your temper with others is quick, that your idols of choice have a growing hold, take a look at your recent habit of thankfulness or thanklessness. It is a good bet that if it has declined, that may be a major reason why those other weeds are growing. A final circumstance, we remember our church family. In the week in and week out of life, in the body of Christ, we are to be thankful to God. And I really just put this application in here so that I could say how thankful I am for you. The circumstance of being a fellow member with you brings gratefulness to my heart before the Lord. I am grateful for you. And if I wasn't a pastor, I would be grateful to be a fellow member among you. I am grateful for your example of serving one another and loving one another. I was just freshly aware this week of examples of people jumping in to serve and sacrificially labor on behalf of others. I am grateful for your encouraging words to me and to one another and how you are quick to see the grace of God in one another and celebrate it. I'm grateful for the labors that you offer to bless other people in the church Those of you who arrive early on Sundays, those of you who host community groups in your homes, those of you who are constantly looking for people to build up with your speech, those of you who who lend your expertise in areas of the internet or video or music or, or ways of serving the community to the church, I am grateful for you. I want your your uh, evidence of God's grace at work in you to be reflected back to God in gratefulness. So I say to him, praise you, Lord, for your grace. 
grace at work in the membership of Redemption Hill Church. You are vessels of the grace of God, and I have the privilege of seeing it week in and week out, and it is to my joy and the glory of God to reflect that back to him in gratefulness. In all of these circumstances, in every circumstance, wherever we find ourselves, we are to have our eyes fixed on the gracious activity of the Lord, and we are commanded to express that sight back to him in worship. My friends, thankfulness requires discipline. It requires discipline. It requires a resolution. It it is an effort. That's why Paul commands it. Paul commands things that require effort. There is a discipline of thankfulness. Let me commend this command to us as one that is thrilling to obey. It is a joyful thing to obey God in this way. A.W. Tozer says, Gratitude is an offering precious in the sight of God, and it is one that the poorest of us can make and be not poorer but richer for having made it. Let me give one more warning before we move on to the cause of this. Cynicism is prevalent in our culture. The hatred of being called a sucker is prevalent in our culture. And you cannot simultaneously fear being possibly wrong in a person and be grateful for them at the same time. Thankfulness does not deny imperfections in the world. It just gladly goes into the vulnerable position of thanking God for this person or this situation or this thing, knowing that there is also difficulty to be endured. That's the command. As he always does, Paul gives a cause as well, a motive. Let's look at that. Let's look at the cause. He says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances for, for, here's the motive, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This is the will of God. The will of God. What what an important phrase. And in our man-centered society, in our man-centered hearts, we need to recognize the divine priority of that phrase. The will of God expresses his moral expectations of humanity as the people he has created and as Christians, those he has recreated in the image of Christ. This is God's purpose for me and you. This is what God has commanded us to do. This is our reason for existing. And one primary reason for existing, according to this verse, is thankfulness. Let's put it directly. Thankfulness is the will of God for Christians. Thankfulness is the will of God for you. What is the will of God for you? Thankfulness. Thankfulness, and as Spurgeon said earlier, it should be the oil that covers over all of our obedience. Thankfulness is the will of God for you. You, If you are a Christian, you are called to thankfulness. I am called to gratefulness. A lifestyle of thanksgiving is the will of God, the God who made us and redeemed us for you and me. Why should we be thankful? Because that's what God's will is for us. Sometimes when people talk about the will of God, they they focus very much on the uncertain, mysterious aspects of the will of God. Should I move to Cincinnati or stay in Austin? Let me clear that up for you. That's actually very clear. They focus on that, should I take this job or should I marry that person? It's, it's, it's subjective, it's not written down in God's word. Studying the will of God should always begin with the will that is absolutely clear. And in my experience, when people read about and focus on, even in those difficult decisions, when, when they focus on the will of God that is absolutely clear, the subjective decisions suddenly begin to become more clear as well. So if you're making decisions in a given moment, 
Should I go to this task or go to this task? Should I take this job or take this job? Should I go here for this next position or should I serve in this area? Begin by focusing on the revealed will of God and study that for a while. Well, this is the revealed will of God, explicit, obedient, commanded. Be thankful. Thankfulness should describe our Christian lives. It is the will of God for us. And to reject the will of God is not to find freedom, but to enslave ourselves to the masters of sin and Satan. And these are not better masters, but worse. Promising joy and delivering only heartache and disappointment. Thankfulness is God's calling on my life. What is the will of God for me in this moment, in this relationship, in this season, in this day, in this night, in this sickness, in this health, in this marriage, in this parenting relationship, in this neighborhood, in this city, in this job? What is the will of God for me? It is thankfulness. And it is the will of God for us in Christ Jesus. Those three words are packed, as they always are in Paul, packed with theological content. They change everything. They change everything about the command, about the joy of the command, about the hope of the command, about the calling of the command. They motivate the command. They fill the command with a joyful delight. It is the will of God for us where, in what context, in Christ Jesus. To be in Christ Jesus is to be brought united to him into the sphere of his salvation and his saving activity. Paul uses that word in Christ Jesus to describe a way of life, a new citizenship, a context of salvation that God has brought us into. In Christ Jesus, the will of God for us is thankfulness. It brings to mind all that it is for us to be in Christ Jesus. It brings all of that to mind. It's as though Paul has been talking about thankfulness and the will of God, and then abruptly he turns the lights on and reveals where we are in a treasure house of spiritual and practical promises Focused on heaven, a new citizenship. Be thankful. It's the will of God for you. And then he flicks the switch. In Christ Jesus, look where you are. And how difficult is it to be thankful here? Not difficult at all. Not difficult at all. Charles Spurgeon again says this. Dear friends, a Christian has infinite cause for gratitude. When I first looked to Christ and was lightened, I thought that if I never received another mercy except that one of being delivered from my load of guilt, I would praise God if he would but let me forever and ever. To have the feet taken out of the miry clay and to feel them set on the rock of ages is a subject for eternal gratitude. But You have not received one spiritual mercy only, beloved brothers and sisters, nor two, nor twenty. You have them strewn along your path in richest profusion. The stars above are not more numerous, nor the sands beneath more innumerable. And that is true, because those two things were made by Christ, and he is the one we have in our salvation. In him, our bondage to our complaining flesh has been broken. Our bondage to cynical doubt and self-protection has been defeated. Our punishment for our failure to give thanks was punished completely in him on the cross. And in him, all of God's love is poured out on us. God the judge has become our loving father. The spirit of God has been poured into our hearts. The very character of our Savior has been provided for us through the work of the Holy Spirit. Heaven has been promised to us and draws nearer to us even at the end of our worst day the will of God for you in Christ Jesus no wonder is thankfulness to be in Christ is to be the recipient of unimaginable grace and to receive the calling of unbounded gratefulness actually the the word gratefulness is tied to grace because the same word root is tied up with the word 
if we did it in English, it might be something like gracefulness, grace, grace reflectingness. It, it, it's to, to celebrate grace is gratefulness. As Paul wrote to the Ephesians, we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption in Jesus Christ according to his purpose and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the beloved. In him, we have an inheritance that cannot be blemished or spotted that will be kept in heaven for us ready to be revealed when the Lord Jesus returns. So Paul flicks that switch and reminds us where we live in Christ Jesus, our sin-bearing substitute, our lamb, our sacrifice, our risen righteousness, our holy king, our greater David, our rescuer, our returning king. He's saying, where would you like to begin? In Christ, we have a thousand reasons to be thankful, an infinite power to exercise thankfulness, and a thousand promises to motivate our thankfulness. We've been given, as David Pallison says, new eyes to see the world. New eyes. So let me encourage a valid, capable resolution. Capable because there is nothing the Holy Spirit would rather do than help us give thanks for the many things we have in Christ Jesus. It is the will of God for us in Christ Jesus to be thankful. It is the joyful, exhilarating command of God for us as Christians. It is our privilege when we fall asleep to recount the preserving grace of God and when we awake to express confidence in the forgiving grace of God. It is our honor to turn every circumstance, every iteration, every conflict, every trial, every surprise, every relationship, every opportunity into a moment of thankful communion with our generous Father who has adopted us in His Son. Let us make a resolution to joyfully obey the command to give thanks for all of the grace He has displayed toward us in 2017, and to make 2018 a year in which the oil of thankfulness covers over every day and every act of obedience and every relationship for His glory and for our joy. Let's pray. Lord, On behalf of our church, Lord, I give you thanks for this year. Lord, the existence of our church, according to your word, is only based on your watchfulness over us. The building of it is only based on your building it. Because, Lord, our watching and our building is a vanity and a mist apart from your watching and your building. So we give you thanks that there is a Redemption Hill Church in existence, and we give you thanks that by your grace it continues to preach your gospel in every small group conversation and Sunday morning sermon. We give you thanks, Lord, because this is not owing to our discernment or our perseverance. It is ultimately owing to your preserving gracious kindness to us. We give you thanks for financial provision. We give you thanks for the many evidences of health. We give you thanks for miraculous healing that we've encountered in various moments throughout this year. We give you thanks, Lord, 
for your power to reach out to the lost, which we have evidence of this year. We give you thanks for the baptisms we've experienced this year. We give you thanks for the growing unity that we are experiencing in our community groups, fellowship with one another in you. We give you thanks for the many servants who labor tirelessly to serve our church. We give you thanks for the leaders in our church who labor to initiate and bear the burden of leadership in various contexts. We give you thanks, Lord, for the new members who have joined our community this year. Lord, for all these things, we give you thanks. You are the author and the giver of every perfect gift. We give you thanks for the things we've seen in your word. We give you thanks for the prayers that have been answered. We give you thanks for the ways you are moving mysteriously in ways we don't understand, Lord, in difficulties that we've experienced. And Lord, we pray for your help to make this coming year a year full of thankfulness. Gratefulness to one another. Gratefulness to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.